sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hello, and welcome to the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. My name is Nick Martin. I'm the editor of High Country News' Indigenous Affairs Desk. I'm also a contributing editor at the New Republic, and I'm a member of the Saponi tribe. I'm here today with authors Kelly Jo Ford and Tony Jensen, who've taken their time today to share with us and be in conversation with us, and we're very grateful for that. To learn more about our authors and their works, please check out loc.gov backslash bookfest. Before we begin, I want to let you all know that we're going to save the last 10 minutes of this 30-minute live event to respond to audience questions, so you can start submitting those now. And without any further ado, we will begin our panel. Kelly, Tony, thank you all both just an incredible amount again for being with us today, for kicking off this festival. Um, you both produce such I'll speak personally, but you both produce such formative works in terms of just creating a space, not just for um, you know, fellow women authors, not just for fellow indigenous authors, but for people who want to enter these spaces, who want to extend conversations um, of who we are as people beyond just rudimentary education. And I think you've both done so in such beautiful with such beautiful prose that it's it is an honor to be here um, with the two of you. So I'm you know thank you. Um, I'm just we have a limited amount of time today, so I have some meaty questions I want to jump into, and then we have some you know lighter ones that we can sneak in there as well. Um, Kelly, I'm going to start uh, with you today, and uh, and your book Crooked Hallelujah um, was one of the amount that it resonated with me and with some other indigenous authors, writers, just citizens, especially people from the South, from the Southeast and just from the South more generally, it, it was really something to see it put on the page. Um, and I just want to, in particular, one of the main themes that I walked away from your book, having a, a deeper appreciation for in terms of your consideration of it and your presentation of it was, the role that Christianity has played within our communities, um, you know, obviously post-colonization, but in particular, I think over the past 100, 200 years, in the way that it has kind of shifted it away from an outright vehicle of assimilative policy and has actually been something that our communities, um, you know, speaking, I know my High Plains community certainly has um, with Calvary Baptist, uh, but it, it, they've become cornerstones in, in many of our communities, not all of them, but many of them. And, and kind of unwinding this very like complicated web of what that relationship means, um, especially in a, as we're kind of seeing generations rise up that are, you know, actively choosing to participate in this. And in particular, I'm thinking about your character, Justine, um, obviously. And there was in the story, Consider the Lilies. Um, I don't know, there's just something about that piece that really I read it I, after when I read the book, I read it several times because I just wanted to sit with it. And it culminates or somewhat culminates in this scene where mama removes Justine's bandages. And we have these lines, this back and forth where she's just trying to explain to her. There's this line mom says where it's, I can't love you to heaven, honey. And Justine eventually, after she's got her praying on her, she says, I don't need your prayers. And, and some ain't in it for the illusion. And and then it's a very violent interaction between um, her mother and, and Justine. And, but it's something where this sense of overwhelming love, there's a dissonance, I think, within this relationship that we hold, where what you, you've done in this, pers in this personal relationship is kind of deconstruct the way that violence is an inherent, has always been inherent to this religion as it relates to indigenous communities, indig indigenous peoples. And, and then this way it manifests in a very personal way, in a very individualistic way. But I'm, I'm just curious if you could take a moment and talk us through what it meant to unwind 
all of that publicly? Because I know these are conversations that many of us have, you know, privately behind closed doors um, with one another, but to have it in such a public forum, I just want to ask one, like, what was, what drove you to, to make that decision? And then two, as you were kind of deconstructing that, how did you approach that violence? And how did you choose in terms of choosing that depiction of it? Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, I want to say quickly, it's an honor to be here um, with you and Tony. Um, so, so thank you for that um, really thoughtful question. Um, I haven't haven't thought about that line in in quite some time, um, but it it's something that I, I approach first. I think from the the personal space um, as as a person who grew up in a Cherokee family that was a part of um, a fundamentalist Christian church um, that saw. Um, you know, both the harsh realities of, of that fundamentalism um, and then also um, sort of the, the loving place that was offered uh, often um, coming from in, in family members. And um, so I think of the, the book is part of part, one of the, the biggest um, threads of the book to me is I, I think of the book as almost a religious haunting for, for Justine. And what we see in that scene is Justine in an act of rebellion. She's she's finally going to stand up to her very religious mother, um, and she does so in a way that um, would be perceived by her mom as just outright um, sacrilege and 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 aggressive. And and she's met with aggression as well. Um, and you know, it's been interesting writing the book that comes from a very personal place. And then stepping back and and thinking about the broader implications of Christianity and our, our communities really after the fact. I, I was dealing with um, a, a lot of um, personal emotions as I as I created these characters and put them in these situations. And then later to have conversations about broader implications has been really a learning experience for me. Um, and thinking about how particular for particularly for like southeastern tribes. Um, you know, Christianity has has been a part of our our, our story for a really long time, um, and in doing so, it is as as you said, kind of a a, a part of the like American colonial colonial project and assimilation and all that. But it's also something that we've adapted and and have um, you know turned into church. Some Christian churches are become you know cornerstones of. Um, of our, our cultures and our languages. And I'm thinking of like Cherokee hymns and things like that. And often people who may not um, be Cherokee speakers um, might might know Cherokee hymns or parts of hymns. And so it's, it's really this kind of, um, you know, there's just a lot of tension in that, that, that dynamic. And, um, you know, I, if I hear a Cherokee hymn, um, you know, I'm immediately just going to start crying um, because it just connects in this deep, deeply home and personal and family level. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot there to think about. Um, I feel like I could talk about that with you all day, but I'm, I will, I will ease back because I would love to, to, to keep chatting and, and hear from Tony as well. Absolutely. Um, and that's just, and I just think, I think part of it comes from this, uh, for a long time, they were a safe space. You know, it, it was a literal physical structure that you could gather in together as Native people and not feel persecuted because it was an allowable action. It was an allowable act of group, um, of community. And we obviously, like anything else Indigenous people do, we we make it our own <laughs> and we put our own stamp on it. And and that doesn't, I don't think, dissolve or erase any sort of the larger implications of that dynamic like you spoke of. But there is a beauty, I think, within kind of the larger messiness, um, or at least like the optimist tries to, in myself, tries to tell, tries to say that over the cynic. Um, it, Tony, I want to bring you into this conversation, um, and, and I'm going to pivot uh, just briefly away from the large topic of Christianity, um, because one of the things that when I think about my work as a journalist, um, and one of the things that I, I think about in terms of when I go to put coffee to a page and I go to bring a document to life, 
our story to life um, is the amount of explaining I want to do and the effectiveness of that explaining versus the educational aspect, or, you know, in terms of seeking to derive an educational aspect of that opposed, or not even always opposed, but in addition to trying to also do something creative with a work or use that explanation in a creative way that won't kind of, you know, come off as native wiki for, you know, non-native readers. Um, and in, in your work, I just feel like it it weaves that in so deftly, so beautifully, because I'm thinking, I can pull a million examples, but there's one in, in chapter two of your book, Carrie, and in the chapter Song Without Words, and, and you're just walking us through so, some of the history of Métis, and, and it works thematically with the rest of the work because you constantly require your reader to pause and think about the etymology and the origins of the language that they're reading and why it presents itself in such a way and the connotations present themselves in such a way in contemporary times. And, and I'm just curious in terms of when you go, when you went to write Carrie and, and also, you know, from the hilltops, I, I just want, I'm just curious as you bake this in, because I've talked with other Native authors about this, about what our responsibility is in terms of bringing readers along who might not know versus trying to extend um, and further conversations we're already having within our own communities. And I just wanted, you know, from a kind of a procedural standpoint, I just wanted to take a step back and just kind of let you do a quick shop class on that because I just feel like your book does it repetitively so beautifully where you're not like, I'm learning something, but you're like, I'm like engaging and reading with something special. So just, I don't, how do you kind of manage that balance or how have you managed to find that balance over time? Thanks for that question. Um, it's really a pleasure to think more about that. Yeah, I would say that in Carrie in particular, I was working toward telling stories of gun violence um, from all across the country, stories of my life. But then, yes, as you say, it's an indigenous story. It's a Meti story. And so I'm also then interested in making sure the audience is grounded, not just in the story in the moment, but, you know, also in culture, in the history. I feel like they need to know more of what I know in order for them to be able to understand the moments and the stories. Um, for me, it's about striking the balance, though, if we're talking about elements of craft and how you do that so it doesn't become kind of an extended history lesson or an extended, you know, um, appeal to, to readers who don't know the history. I think that for me, sometimes I'm writing and weaving, maybe dropping Easter eggs, let's say, you know, into the story for people who are already on the inside of it. Um, and then other times I feel like it is important to gesture to the outside to make sure everyone's grounded, that they know what's going on too. So in that chapter two that you mentioned, we were just talking about that in one of my classes last week, a student asked me about some of those moments. And we started calling them Dear White Reader Moments or Dear Non-Native Reader Moments, where, you know, there's a moment where I talk about my father, for example, and how he's drinking at a bar during hard economic times with everyone else in our small town. And I say, I stop and kind of directly address the reader there and just say, don't mistake me here. Everyone else on those bar stools, none of them are Native, right? They're all white men. And everyone in this town is suffering from these same sort of socioeconomic pressures. They were all there because they'd lost their jobs. They were all there drinking together. Um, you know, we can't read this. It's just another drunk Indian narrative. And that felt necessary because it's chapter two. And I want to be sure no one misunderstands that moment. So yeah, I don't do that often. But when I do in the book, I feel like it's crucial. It's crucial for readers not to be misunderstanding the moment. And sometimes that's necessary. And I, and that, and I want to bring you both into this next question, um, because it's something it, I think it comes down to this question that I'm always just curious about when I when I speak with authors, um, regardless, you know, not always just indigenous authors, but um, obviously, particularly, but I'm just curious about this, this larger question of audience. And, and when you're sitting down to write a book, because so often we live within this 
you know, not to get to whatever about it, but we lived within capitalistic structures that require this book has to, in order for it to be this career path to be a viable one for us, must be able to appeal to an, an audience large enough to, to purchase it, right? And I don't think that that necessarily always means editorially shaping the work towards that goal, but also when you're when you're thinking about this, when we're thinking about carving out a space for more indigenous writers so that they don't have to do as much explaining as what books in the past have had to do. I'm just curious, how do y'all, when you sit down and, and start to not even like formulate what a structure is, but just think about what do I want this book to accomplish? Who, what do I want a reader to, to take away from it, to engage with it um, as? And do you have, like, do you picture indigenous readers holding your book? Do you also picture non-indigenous readers hold is it a is it a mix like what is that kind of vision for y'all because it's something i struggle with a lot so i would just love to hear how y'all think about your audience um from that kind of very initial standpoint uh, I'll, uh kelly you go first and then tell me sorry <laughs> Um, thank you. So that's a really good question. And I, it, as, as you were, you were asking it, I, I kept thinking of this thing that, that people often say, it's like a cliche, I guess, but your first book, you write the book that you need to write. And then the next book you write what you want to write, something like that. Um, but, but I feel like for this book, which is my debut, I very much wrote the book that I needed to write. Um, and and so I was was focused on these characters story by story, um, and I when I when I thought about an audience, honestly, it was really afterward when like the fear set in. <laughs> but when I thought of my ideal audience, I want a wide readership. I want to sell books, and I want this to be a viable career path. Um, I certainly wasn't thinking that it it was. Um, you know, I was just felt like I just needed to write these stories as they needed to come out um, in some form or fashion. Um, but after the fact, when when the book was was going and, and it's this moment of, oh, God, I've, I've done it. You know, um, I thought about readers back home. I thought about my family. I thought about um, Cherokee people in Oklahoma, people from Oklahoma and North Texas and rural towns. I, I thought about those people and I wanted them to read the book and feel like I had gotten some something right, some parts of these characters in the world they live in. I felt like I wanted them to read the book and, and have some sense of recognition. Um, and maybe ultimately representation as well. Um, but those, those were the things that I thought it might be different for a second book though. I suspect it will be. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with a lot of what Kelly Jo is saying, unsurprisingly. Um, I also feel like I was thinking first and foremost of family. And my book takes place all over the country, all the different places I've lived. And so I was thinking of all the different communities, not just Mechi community, Alberta Mechi specifically, but all the communities I've lived in all over the United States and I'm representing them. I'm talking about native history um, and native lived presence in those regions, right? I'm telling stories of, you know, bad things that have happened to people there and sometimes happy things too. And so am I getting that right? I was thinking essay by essay, chapter by chapter, really of, of the people who I'm writing about and how I'm responsible to them. And then I guess, yes, sort of maybe like Kelly Joe at the very end in the editorial process, which was, you know, I was adding in parts about George Floyd in my book in June, and the book came out in September. So, you know, very end that hour, I thought, oh, what about other readers? But really, I was writing to and for my own communities um, all across the country, you know, places I've, I've lived and worked. I was thinking of those people first. And I think that who you're writing to and who you're writing for, those can be separate questions. So I was writing to those people. And I guess until the very end, I didn't allow myself very much to think about who I was writing for. But talking about marketing and all of that um, at the end of editorial, I thought, oh, now I have to think about also who this is for, not just who this is to. I think that's a beautiful kind of delineation to make in terms of two versus four, because it's that's really 
that's important. And, and, I, and I almost, that's great because I wish I would have framed the question that way, but I'm glad you made me think about it like that. Thank you, Tony. Um, we, we're almost at the, um, the 10 minute mark. I only see one question in the Q&A queue um, at the moment. So I have one more kind of question um, that I wanna, I wanna hit on from, for, both, for both of you. Um, and it's kind of a meta question. <laughs> so we're gonna, we're gonna consider ourselves a little bit here. Um, yeah, I'm curious to know the feelings you two have, uh, because particularly y'all both, y'all both published books. You've gone on, you've done book tours, you've given talks, you've had to do events like this before. Um, and, and I'm just curious to know the feelings you two have regarding what I sometimes see to be like, it can be at times like an incongruent boxing of indigenous artists together for the sake of them being indigenous artists together right like and this can be something as simple as a you know a native a section where all the native books are kept um, in a bookstore it can be something like a panel like this where we all get together and have conversation about the works themselves but i'm just curious thinking more broadly of it because oftentimes you know as a writer as a journalist i don't want just my work to be in conversation just with other indigenous i do want it to be in conversation with other native journalists and writers but i want it to be in conversation with a much with a broader field of journalism with a broader field field of literature um, and i'm just i just wanted to open that up just thinking about because i think we've already established um, through action what the usefulness uh, is of having us being able to come together and to extend the conversation beyond some of the more rudimentary Q and A's or questions you might field elsewhere. But yeah, I don't know, the native lit world is an admittedly small one. And so I do recognize sometimes this is just out of necessity, but I am just, as we can kind of consider our place in the National Book Festival, in the literary industry, and we wanna create space for more indigenous writers coming up behind us, um, behind y'all, like I wanna just know like, how do we kind of navigate this space while where we are grouped together because of who we are, even though all not all the times in this instance, I think so, but not all the times our works aren't always, you know, one to one matches or aren't necessarily always in conversation with one another. So I don't know. I just wanted to leave that kind of open ended. Tony, I'll let you go first for that one. Yeah, I think about this a lot since I teach at Institute of American Indian Arts and I also teach at University of Arkansas where you know, um, that's very far from the territories I'm from. So it feels really natural for me to be in conversation with Southern Native writers because I teach and write from the South on their lands, on their territories, right? And so it feels good to be in these conversations, but no, that's not properly where I'm from, um, despite how I've adapted a slight Southern accent. Stephen Graham Jones was my teacher at Texas Tech. He's a writer I admire a lot, a thinker I admire, Blackfeet writer. And Stephen has a great talk, and I think it was made into an essay too, about how a young letter to Indigenous writers, and in it he talks about wanting our work to be on all the shelves. And that's how I like to think of it too, and that's how I like to approach it, just that, you know, we could have our work on any shelf we want it to be on, the horror shelf, the mystery shelf, the poetry shelf, right? Like it shouldn't just be one shelf for native literature. We should have our conversations amongst ourselves and then also our work should be on the shelf. So I guess that's where I see things headed ideally and um, where how I like to approach it. I, I agree. I mean, with with everything Tony said, um, like for me, uh, particularly as an at large citizen of the Cherokee Nation, like it, when I am grouped with Native writers, it's a tremendous honor, um, and I want that. But but absolutely, I I also want um, my work to be in conversation with you know literature at large too. I I don't really think that I have anything to to add other than that like it, it's it's an honor just just to be grouped you know with with native writers and like let's let's keep going we we have a lot to offer and there's so many um native writers right now who are just writing powerful works of literature across the genres and um i i just hope that i i hope that we're all doing what we can to make spaces, um, particularly people in publishing and readers. I, I feel like the world is ready and um, certainly there are indigenous writers who are already doing it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so let's move over to, we've got some more um, questions in the Q&A chat now. So we're gonna move over to, to reader questions or viewer questions. Um, the, the top one right now is, is from Kevin uh, and, it's, and it's simple so we could do this one pretty quickly, but if you could tell your younger, uh, your younger writing self anything, what would it be? Um, I'll, I'll go. I, I would just yeah. um, tell, I would just tell her it, it will be okay. Um, it took me a really long time to write um, my book and it, for, for a lot of reasons that were absolutely valid most of the time. Um, so I would tell her it, it's okay. Like take the time that you need to do this work. It's, it's digging deep and it's important for you um, as a person and a writer. Um, hang in there, stick with it. Don't worry so much about how long it takes. Keep going. Yeah, I would give my younger self permission to write everything down and not to think about publishing it as you write it. Some things are necessary to write, but they're not necessary to publish and you'll know and to trust, you know, whether everything you write should be published or some of it you keep for yourself. I love that. <laughs> um, that's a great reminder for, for every writer everywhere. Um, uh, Scott Weaver uh, had a question, which is, I believe both of you have taught at community college um, colleges, and, and I wonder how that type of teaching experience informs how you think about your writing. Um, we'll start with Tony this time. Yeah, I started my teaching career at Mojave Community College, and it's still one of the favorites of all the places I've taught, and it's a long list. Um, my students, I was 25 years old, and my students were mostly women who were coming back to school 30s up through 50s. So I would say what I take with me from those days most is to think of how brave they were to be showing up in an educational space when they'd been out of school for so long and how they were reinventing themselves. And we get to do that all the time as writers. And so they set an example for me early that I still try to follow. Um, my, my first um, job teaching was also at a community college at College of um, Western Idaho in Boise. And um, I taught developmental <clears throat> English. And um, I also had a lot of students who were returning to school after many years and who um, worked so hard, but, but didn't necessarily come into the classroom with the confidence that they could succeed. And so I think what I take away from that now is, is, is in inspiration. Um, and um, I, I think it, it informs my teaching in, in a lot of ways. And one thing that I remember from that class is the community and how um, in that classroom, the people supported one, an, one another. And basically, we just agreed that we were going to work hard no matter where we were starting from. Um, and so I take great heart in that. And I feel like that's the kind of community I, I, I aspire to, to help facilitate in, in writing workshops as well um, at, at any level. Absolutely. Um, we've got about two and a half minutes left, so we'll go, we'll move quickly here. Um, I, I want to get this one in from Ruby Henson um, Murray, which is, uh, how have your communities responded to these two wonderful books? Because um, I think that is important. We kind of talked about where, who they were for earlier, but that's a great question in terms of actual response. Um, Kelly, would you, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I've, I've had a lot of support um, from, from back home. Um, so I've just been really grateful that, that people were open to the book. And um, I've had a, a lot of support from, from all kinds of communities as well. Um, Cherokee people from Oklahoma, people um, from, you know, Plains tribes who, who also grew up in fundamentalist churches of some kind. Um, just, um, I, I just feel like I've just been really, really supported wholeheartedly. And so I'm, I feel really grateful for that. It seems like there's a lot of kindness and love and, and lifting up going on for me. Yeah, I've had a similar experience. Um, I've had many indigenous women, native women from all over the United States and Canada reaching out, sharing personal stories with me through social media, through my website, through email. Um, some men too, talking about how they recommended my book to their aunties or their cousins or their sisters. Um, and so I think that's been the biggest pleasure and surprise for me is how many native women I've been able to be put in contact with who've been 
had similar experiences and have liked seeing, even though I think it's hard, have, have liked seeing, you know, those experiences rendered on the page and that someone else went through it, right? I think it's always good to see that in literature, that someone else went through it and was able to write about it. Absolutely. Well, we are at the 30, 28, 27 second mark. Um, so I think we will wrap it up here. I just want to I want to say thank you to the to both of you for for joining us today. Thank you to the National Book Festival for having us, uh, all of us, for this conversation. It's been so wonderful. I really appreciate all the time and effort from the audience for the questions. Um, again, just really appreciate everybody's time, and I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the festival. <laughs>